was talking on the phone. The lightning came down the phone line, entered my neck. It went through my spine, threw me up in the air. And there was this slight buzzing at the ear, and I felt myself pop out of the body. Then I felt myself float up to the ceiling. And the doctor and the nurse were in there, and he was looking at me, he said, she's gone, she's dead. And I was taken to hospital. Uh, doctors did anything they could to help me, but I was declared dead. I realized I was out of my body when I was suddenly looking at, at this light. Out of that light stepped the most amazing being I have ever been in the presence of. It was just total selflessness, uh, understanding, uh, kindness, all-consuming love wonderful love. After a time and this light, uh, all of these people have to pay a return trip back. What they tell us is that the reason they chose to come back was not for themselves, because for themselves, they would rather have stayed with this presence of love. When they do return, incidentally, uh, then the story becomes very interesting from the point of view of human psychology, because we find that these patients are profoundly changed that they are imbued with a totally new value structure, that uh, whatever uh, in their lives before they had been chasing, whether it was uh, money or power or fame or any of these other things that people seek, uh, they say that after this experience, their, their value primarily is to love others, to seek loving relationships with their fellow human beings. And also they tell us that they have no more fear of death whatsoever. How are you? Oh no, what's the matter? What, what's happened to him? Oh no. Oh no. I was shocked when I got that phone call. One that nobody ever wants or ever really expects to get. There's just so many feelings that I really want to share. I, I just want to be there. Okay. Okay, well, we'll see you soon. Mom, I love you. My dad was fighting for every breath of life, and it didn't look very hopeful. Even though we lived 600 miles apart and only saw each other on holidays, at least we were on the same planet. And we could pick up the phone and say hello. The likelihood of losing all that seemed almost impossible to grasp. Dear Dad, I'm so sorry to hear about what you're going through. I know you're rugged, but you gave us a good scare. Dear Dad, I'm writing you this letter because I don't know if I'll ever see you again, yet I have so much I want to say. Dad, do you remember several years ago when I was still grieving over the death of Suzanne? 
I found a great deal of comfort in some books I was reading about dying. It was at that time that I met a doctor of psychiatry, a researcher named Dr. Raymond Moody. I'm sending a copy of a book that he wrote, which was a great deal of help to me then. Dr. Moody has observed a pattern that occurs in people the world over, regardless of their culture or religion. As a matter of fact, the prior religious beliefs or background of the person doesn't seem to have much to do with whether or not they have an experience and even the content of the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we've even had people who say that prior to their experience they were atheists or agnostics mm -hmm. who have very beautiful and full-blown near-death experiences. Really? And do they remain atheist and agnostic? Not at all. Once they come back, mm. they tell us that they're totally transformed and they have no more doubt whatsoever that there is a God and that there is a life after death. It's about his research on the stories of people who have approached death, many of whom actually had the experience of dying and then were revived and lived to tell about it. What happened is I felt like I'd been hit by a train. But what had happened was I was talking on the phone, holding the telephone like this. The lightning came down the phone line, entered my neck. It went through my spine, threw me up in the air. As it threw me in the air, it knocked me out of my shoes and welded the nails in the heels of my shoes to the nails in the floor, which is how I was grounded and I didn't explode. Before I shot myself, I measured like we did in CPR to find where the heart was. And that's where I just took the, the barrel and put it up against my chest and pulled the trigger. I had not responded to treatment. I was getting worse. And the doctor had come to see Anne. At this point, he says, I, I've lost her. She's gone. And I thought, well, who's he talking about? But just before this, I have been in terrible pain. I was just hurting so bad, I wanted to get away from it. Fifteen minutes before I was to be picked up by a jeep, uh, I was discovered to have a temperature of 106 and a half. And instead of waiting for the jeep, the captain in charge of the ward sent me over to x-ray. And the last thing I remember was the captain in charge of the x-ray asking him. I thought I could stand up long enough for them to get a picture of my chest. And I remember hearing that x-ray making that peculiar whirring sound and then a click and I'm told that I collapsed in a heap. This wasn't a typical bee sting because I quickly realized uh, that there was a problem. And I tried to telephone someone for help. The, uh, the rest of the ranger station was about three miles in and I tried to telephone my boss to, to send some help. And I fell and went unconscious. And luckily, from what I understand, he drove through, my boss drove through a little while later and noticed that I, I normally just waved to him as he came by and I was lying down on the floor and he called the ambulance. I was a dissident in Soviet Union and I had an invitation from United States uh, in 1975 I received this invitation in 1976, I was given the exit visa, and I was leaving for uh, New York that day, and I was coming to take uh, my passport, and I was ready to fly. My family was already in airport waiting for me. That time, on sidewalk, I was here, moved over or run over by car. Um, it was fabricated by KGB. They wanted to kill me and not to let me go. And I was taken to hospital. Uh, doctors did anything they could to help me, but I was declared dead. This is pretty much all over the world we found this common pattern. Um, they tell us that at this point where their doctor says they are dead, that they may actually hear the physician say, uh, oh my, uh, he's dead, or we've oh. lost her, or something like that. 
and they say that from their perspective actually they still feel very much alive indeed their consciousness is heightened wow. and they tell us that they seem to leave their physical bodies mm -hmm. they say that they float up typically right above the um, bed in the operating room or the emergency room and they look down and they can see their own physical bodies lying on the bed down below I was above my body I was floating and there were people around me except I didn't realize that that person there was me but then all of a sudden I heard this statement he's gone he's gone and it was the paramedic making that statement to the driver at that point I was standing behind the paramedic I was watching him work on my body. And suddenly there was commotion beneath me, and then I started noticing all of the people underneath me, and the, the EMS um, workers were pushing the stretcher down the hall, and I really wasn't concerned with my body. I was more concerned with, there were a couple of plainclothes policemen over where the guns were, and they were, one of them was wrong about something, and I was trying to tell him that he was wrong. But I could see the soldiers and the nurses and the doctors, but they could not see me. And I went from ward to ward, bed to bed, trying to find a soldier that I thought that looked like me lying in the bed. I was becoming more and more desperate because, as I say, I could see these human beings, but I could not communicate with them. Finally, I went into this little isolated ward room and sure enough, lying in the bed with the sheet pulled up over the head was this body that I had to recognize as me because it had my fraternity ring on its finger. And there was this slight buzzing at the ear and I felt myself pop out of the body. I was, I don't know how I came out, I was just suddenly out of the body. And I sat down on the head of the bed to, a minute to look around. Then I felt myself float up to the ceiling and I was looking down and he said, she's gone. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought, well, who's gone? And I was trying to look down to see. And I felt presences with me. A guardian angels is what they were, but I called them guides. I was suddenly looking at, at this light that seemed to be in the corner of the room. But um, the first thing I thought was, where did you come from? And she said, I've always been here, but you weren't able to see me before. The reason I use she is because uh, she emanated uh, feelings of selflessness, uh, love, all-consuming love, uh, understanding, uh, kindness. And those were attributes that I thought of as being feminine. After a while in this, uh, they say that they begin to feel an indescribable feeling of bliss, that it's something that transcends words, that we can't put it into the language that we have in everyday life. One man, for instance, told me that uh, although he was in great pain uh, in his chest prior to leaving his body, as soon as he left his body, that he was overcome with a tremendous sense of joy and peace, a kind of ecstasy. There was absolute freedom of your soul and body. And this amazed me. And this was very interesting too. I was happy to be in such experience because I could see their thoughts. I could see everything what was happening. I could smell, I could hear, and I could see their thoughts. This was the main thing that was very, very making me happy and proud. I don't know if this word is good to use here or not, but I'm proud of that, that I can see their thoughts. But I can remember that it felt very exciting to be above and to be out and looking down and not threatening at all. Then I knew I was supposed to be keeping up with my body, so I followed my body through the hall and out the front door. and. There, there's something about being outside when you're out of your body, but when I got outside, I just, was just wonderful. But it seemed like I was always just kind of looking through the ambulance because I was enjoying being outside. It's really kind of a nice experience so, with the lights and everything and the feeling of lightness. As I have come out, 
I'm in no pain, but I'm also just free of everything. I'm no one's wife, mother, or daughter. I'm just myself alone. I have a distinct memory of always trying to look at myself and thinking how much better looking I thought I was than that. Because this guy was ugly, he was in trouble, and he had these blue lines all down his face. And I was happy, truly happy, to be away from that body. They could have it. And I did not feel one bit of remorse or sadness, no matter what had happened. But it was not bothering me. I saw my body and I hated it, and I didn't want to come to my body back. It looked like this sort of a feeble, sick person. And it didn't dawn on me until it seemed like many minutes later, I'm sure it was a flash, that that person was me. And that they were trying to revive me because I was dying. And I, in fact, my heart had stopped. There's a skeptical part of me, too. Mm -hmm. And I wonder sometimes whether or not this might just be people's hallucinations mm -hmm. that they're going through, up, mm -hmm. or just a, a natu natural shutting down process when the, when the brain is dying. Mm -hmm. I used to wonder about that myself, uh, Peter. Uh, what has turned me around on that issue is that so often these patients are able to give us very correct descriptions of what was going on during the resuscitation mm -hmm. uh, from a point of view they couldn't have had from that, the perspective of that physical body lying on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, my friend Kim, who is, works at a medical university out west, mm -hmm. was telling me that she was involved in resuscitating a young patient named Maria. Mm -hmm. And Maria had been believed dead, but was successfully revived, and when she came back to consciousness, my friend Kim happened to be uh, standing there by her bedside. Mm -hmm. And Maria grabbed onto Kim and said, during the resuscitation, mm -hmm. when she was out of her body, mm -hmm. she drifted outside of the hospital entirely and saw an old shoe on a ledge mm -hmm. on a window outside an upper floor of the hospital. And Kim was actually able to go there and to verify that the shoe was there exactly as the, the patient had specified. Really? And all of a sudden, I'm aware of people out in the hall. The room had been sealed off because he was going to do surgery in the room. So I immediately went out through the door, did not open it, just went out. I was immediately on the other side of the, in the hall. But I go up to my daughter and I try to make her hear me. Kathy, go home and change your clothes. I couldn't make her hear me, so I went to her dad. And I said, Judd, take Kathy home, change her clothes. She should be out like this. While they were in the hall, uh, and I was trying to send them home, a brother of my husband's came up. And he was talking to him, and he had gotten worried to come. And one of his neighbors had, was also in the hospital, and he came up and started talking to my brother-in-law, wanting to know what he was doing at the hospital and what he was going to do that weekend. He said, well, it looks like my sister-in-law was going to kick the bucket, and I was planning to go to Athens, but I'll stick around now to be a pallbearer. Later, I was also able to talk to him. He did want to admit it, but he did admit this is what he had said, and I laughed at him because it embarrassed him. It was amazing that I, I, I was never leaving my body, too. I was everywhere who thought about me, but I was with my body. It means that I, I was not leaving one part for another. I was everywhere the same time. I could be in New York, I could be in Longview, Texas. I could be uh, in uh, Moscow, I could be in, in Tbilisi, Georgia. In any place, there was no distance and time at that time with me. And this time, I'm thinking, I want to see my sister. So I immediately find myself in Rockville, Maryland, at her home. And she's getting ready to go grocery shopping. She's wearing a beige suit with a green blouse. She's had to go over the house and look for her keys that she had misplaced, had to find her grocery list. And finally, she walks out her front door to get in her blue Monte Carlo Chevrolet. And I 
feel there's no need for me to go to the grocery store with her, so I let her go on, and I'm going to pop over then to another sister who lives a few miles away from her. And this other sister had already left home. I was able to determine she had gone grocery shopping herself. So the guides asked me, was I ready to leave this area now? And I agreed, said yes. About two weeks after I had this near-death experience, I was in contact with my sisters, and I brought this fact up to her and described, and she said, well, how did you know? I didn't see you, you weren't here. I could communicate with the children, with very little children who couldn't speak and who couldn't walk and who were very little and just coming from that place where I was going. And this was amazing communication with them, uh, spiritual communication. We, we never spoke in words, we spoke in, in uh, mental communication. And uh, she had broken hip and nobody understood why she was crying so loud. And uh, the doctors and these parents were very concerned about this. And I said, don't cry anyway. Nobody will understand why do you cry. And she, she stopped crying and she uh, smiled, you know. And, and it was incredible experience for that people who were around. And they looked at her and said, what's happened? Why she's not crying at this time? I want to tell them that, you know, she has this disease. This happened with her but I couldn't communicate with them. After the third day when I was um, back to my body and after three days when I could speak, I said to them that, you know, your daughter is uh, crying because of this. She has a broken hip and, you know, and uh, this is the diagnosis which you are seeking on, you know, and they, they found that it was truth, you know. They were shocked and they were surprised. I've also wondered whether or not people may not just be uh, going to places that they've they've known before in their in their memory mm -hmm. well they certainly do that they they do go to places where they have been but they also fairly frequently end up in places where they they didn't know existed on the way and in one case that of dr george ritchie mm -hmm. he was actually able to uh, find a place that he had seen in his out-of-body experience I had left that room, went as far as uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi. Saw a man getting ready to go into a white all-night cafe there on the corner of the street there in Vicksburg and asked him if uh, he could tell me if I was going in the right direction to get to Richmond. And this man acted the same way that a boy, ward boy had in the corridor that I passed as I was going out of the hospital. Uh, like he could neither see me nor hear me. Actually, I walked right through the ward boy going out. But I was so determined to get back to Richmond, that never even stopped me. And when this guy couldn't see me, then I realized that there was a vast change. Something was wrong that these people could neither see nor hear me. The way that I know that it was Vicksburg, Mississippi, because 10 months after this experience, I came back through Vicksburg and recognized the white all-night cafe on the corner. Time and distance as you and I comprehended in this room simply does not exist because simply by wanting to be heading back towards Richmond apparently I was. And before I tell you about the most adventurous kind of out of body traveling, I want you to promise me that you'll come to visit me and say goodbye before you actually leave this world. There are occasional reports from people who experience another dramatic form of traveling, that they actually leave their body, zoom up above the earth, and travel far into space and see the Earth down below. Dr. Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, was an example of this phenomenon when he had his near-death experience in 1944 in a heart attack. At the beginning of 1944, I broke my foot, and this misadventure was followed by a heart attack. Extremely strange things began to happen to me. It seemed to me that I was high up in space, Far below, I saw the globe of the Earth bathed in a gloriously blue light. I saw the deep blue sea and the continents. I could see the snow-covered Himalayas. I knew that I was at the point of departing from the Earth. 
the sight of the earth from this height was the most glorious thing I had ever seen. After a while in this situation, though, they've come to realize that um, although they can see and understand perfectly what's happening, no one else is able to see or hear them. Uh, so they seem to undergo a state of, of turning inward of the sense of identity, if I could call it that. They become aware that this phenomenon they're experiencing has something to do with what we call death. And it's at that point that the more transcendental parts of the near-death experience tend to unfold. I have this pain, and I am in darkness. I cannot see anything. Then I cannot move hand, then I cannot move my body. And then I understood that I am not there, but I am. And it scared me, fear, unknown. Why are all people afraid of darkness? Because they don't know what is in darkness. The fear of darkness is because of unknown. Ununderstandable makes you to be afraid of something. That's why I was afraid too. I was afraid of this darkness. I was afraid of being there. But more afraid was that I was somewhere without my body. But I was. And I, I was a scientist, you know. I worked on idea of psychology and uh, languages, you know. I learned uh, physics, I learned chemistry, I learned many other physiologies, uh, anatomy. And uh, all it was based on dialectical materialism, historical materialism. And in my idea, it was impossible to be somewhere without your body. Where is my main component, my life, my body? You know, I was scared to death, <laughs> but I was already dead. And this, that was the amazing feeling to understand that you are, but you are not, if you think you are. If I think, I thought, I am. But if I am, and if I think, why cannot I think positively what's happening around me? And I began to think about light. I saw light outside of darkness, and it shocked me. But first feeling which I had was to come to that light. The first thought which came to me was to go into this light. And I had that movement. They uh, describe to us how they seem to be drawn into an enclosure of some sort. They often call it a tunnel. And they go through this tunnel quite rapidly and they come out on the other side into an incredibly brilliant and warm and loving light. Don't know exactly how I entered the tunnel or just at what point, but it was when the guides had asked me and I said yes. And I feel myself going in an upward motion. The tunnel is not too big, um, just seemed for one person to go one at a time. It doesn't touch you. Oh, I didn't reach out and touch the walls, but it's black, and I feel myself going up and looking at light, bright light at the end of the tunnel. And the next, as I'm going along, I see the gray area, but I did not stop to go in and see just what was going on. I went on to come out into this beautiful pasture valley land. Flowers, bright, beautiful light, brilliant color. Nothing here is like it at all. The next thing I remember is I heard a set of chimes. And as I looked at an angle, probably 40, 35 or 40 degrees, I could see a tunnel. The tunnel was like a spiral, like it was moving whether I was moving or not. Then I began to whisk down it, and I could hear these chimes. But I was in utter peace and utter tranquility. And it was such a stark, dramatic difference between the way that body was and what was happening to that body and this place I was, this utter peace. As I moved closer to the light, I was kept being surrounded and filled with this love, this love of like, I can't describe it except when you haven't seen your parents in a long time. 
If you've been away from your family and when you first see your mom and your dad, that feeling when you're a small kid, that feeling that you get, I knew I was safe, I knew everything was peaceful, and I knew it was right. As I came into the tunnel, came through the tunnel, I came into a place much like walking out of a dark room into a bright room, as if my eyes were trying to adjust to this brilliant light. The contrast between the brilliant light of the lightning bolt and the brilliant light that was in the tunnel was another thing that was quite dramatic because this light was so brilliant and so bright, it passed through me, it permeated me. It, 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 it and I became one. For years now, we've been using the expression of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I wonder whether it was started, perhaps, by people who had near-death experiences many years ago. In fact, I've been shown some paintings of just this scene that were done several hundred years ago. In the 15th century, the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch even painted this theme in his painting, Ascent of the Blessed. In the foreground and the bottom of the painting, we see people who are dying. And as they are dying, they're surrounded by spiritual beings who attempt to turn their attention upwards. Above them, there's a tunnel which goes off into the distance. And at the end of the tunnel is a very bright light. As these people go through the tunnel, they kneel reverently into the light. So we know then that these experiences have existed among human beings from time immemorial. In this light, they often tell us that they see relatives or friends of theirs who have already died, who seem to be there to meet them and to greet them and to help them through this transition. Particularly very great thing happened with me. It was that I saw my parents, my real parents, and. I understood that they were killed. And they were killed by KGB in Moscow, and I was happy of this. It's, it sounds very ridiculous, but you know, it, I was happy because I was thought that I was a, a, a abandoned by them. And I'd lost a girlfriend in the polio epidemic in the 30s. I think it was 38, but I'm not positive of that date. And she assured me that everything was fine and she was happy. And I also saw my grandparents coming to meet me. I had never known my grandfathers. They had both passed away before I was born. But I did know my grandmothers and my mother also. And as I'm there, this baby appears to me. And he says, hi, I'm your brother. And I said, I don't have a brother. And we don't talk as I'm talking to you. There was no way of misunderstanding. It was more like it was mental telepathy. And he shows himself to me as a small infant dressed in a cap and a little long dress with the knitted sack over it, booties and socks, and tells me to look me over now and remember how I look this way and you can tell our father when you get back and he'll tell you it's happened. And when I was able to talk to him, my dad said, well, I don't know how you knew that because nobody but your mother and the doctor and I knew about these things. So it gives me hope to know that whatever happens, we'll be seeing each other again one day as we're greeted by those loved ones, family and friends who have already died. All these greeters seem to be encouraging us to come into the presence of that light and are letting us know that everything is going to be okay. The being of light that these patients often describe encountering is plainly a personal being. They say that they are in the presence of a being of complete love who accepts them and loves them totally and who has a wonderful personality, is very knowledgeable about them, very wise, very helpful, also uh, has a wonderful sense of humor. This is the most wonderful part of it. This is a warm, loving light. It's the most masculine, but it also has overtones of mother love, sisterly love. This just pulsates around. He has totally accepted me 
and forgiven me for everything I've ever done, but can I forgive myself for some of these selfish things I have done? She took on all the pain and all the suffering with total understanding of what had brought me to that point. And it was like we were intertwined and in that everything that I felt, she felt too. Um, and there was this unconditional love like most parents have for, for their children. Um, that no matter how bad I might have been or um, that I was totally loved and totally understood because she understood the motivation behind what I did. Um, there was this, this togetherness, this empathy um, that she had for me and just wonderful love. And sitting there wondering what to do next when suddenly that room became flooded with light and then three things happened simultaneously just like that. Something deep inside of the spiritual being sitting on the side of the bed looking at the corpse lying in the bed was told to stand up here in the presence of the Son of God. Out of that light stepped the most amazing being I have ever been in the presence of, the most powerfully built male I have ever seen. To my right, I saw a being coming toward me. In those days, I had never heard of the death experience or ever had it described to me, so I had no idea how to relate to it. Since then, I've heard people describe it as God or Jesus or Moses or lots of different names, a great angel. I, I believe that this being of light was my higher self the greater part of me looking at the part of me that just experienced this life. As this being, because this being, I was so comfortable with this being and so assured that only I, if someone knew themselves and knew the love of God in them, then they could have that same relationship with themselves. And it was as if this being had come to be with me. And now once being in the presence of a being who knows everything about you, to know that he totally accepts you and totally loves you, I never wanted to leave this being again under any circumstance. Yeah, this is one of the most interesting parts of the near-death experience to me. Um, these patients will tell us that in the closing moments of their life, often in the presence of this being of love who is with them, that they see a panorama before them which consists of every single thing that they've ever done in their lives from the moment of their birth right through the time of their close call with death. And they say that they see it all simultaneously, not with the events in temporal sequence, but rather all display there at once in a way that they find very difficult to describe. As those hospital walls virtually disappeared and I saw every minute detail of my life, seeing my own cesarean section birth through the 20 years that I had lived because I was only 20 at the time. With the light, there is this panoramic view of my life. It starts with birth. It continues right on to where we are at this point. All at the same time, I am part of the view as well as being watching it. I am actually doing these things. I guess it's a speeded up version of a camera that just runs double time or something. But I actually had the feelings of what was going on as I saw it and also standing off to the side and being able to look around and look at the different things that went on at different times in my life. I saw all my life, but it's in that dimension which cannot be described. This was holographical view of uh, being inside of your life and then being as a, uh, as a viewer participating the play of theater which happening there but it is you and you know that you are this at Disney World they have this Kodak uh, ride where you you sit in this seat and you go that there's this movie that surrounds you and it makes you feel like you're a part of the action and you you can even get butterflies when there's a big drop or something so the, it was around me in, in a form to where it was like I was participating. Um, but it was participating 
in the mind or, or in thought, but it just seemed like a lifetime of pain happened in just a short period of time. If I had a panoramic view of my life, every feeling, every thought, every action, every deed, all at the same time, the same time. And as it started happening, I began to see how I affected the person that I had the encounter with or the experience, whether it be me personally or whether it be someone else, and then how they were affected, how it was one step removed from us and how they were affected. And believe me, there is nothing hidden in your life. If you imagine this panorama of your life as like a still pond, and each action in your life is like a pebble which you flip into that pond. Mm -hmm. At the point where that pebble impacts on the surface, you see ripples going out. Right. But he said that, that as these ripples in this panorama impinge on others, yep. then you can yep. see the secondary effects oh. going off from those people right. in the form of ripples. I see. So I think it illustrates how tied in we all are to one another in this life, how profoundly our actions and our feelings affect others. And of course, in this life review, we're made aware of that in a very profound way. Yeah. And people say, too, that it's not the, the uh, events in your life that you would necessarily expect which get reviewed. It's not the big accomplishments, but rather the simple acts of kindness, often things that you would even have forgotten. You will see the things that you did out of your heart, helping an old woman, picking a kid up, helping someone, an action that you take, uncalculated, unthought, just out of goodness of your heart. These things herald through the universe, not your great accomplishments, not what you achieve or what you think has value. The little things have value. And what I had always thought was important and nice things I had done, they didn't even count for anything. It's the little unknown things that you do for one another. And love there is always helping to give others love and helping hand along the way. And at the same time, you're benefiting because you're receiving also. And the question was, what have you done with your life to show me? Well, I'm looking around this panoramic view and I'm hoping that uh, you'll notice some good things, and of course I'm trying to pick the best thing and hopefully you won't see rather, some rather embarrassing things that happened to me as a teenager. And I thought, well, I was an Eagle Scout. Immediately came back, that glorified you. Again, the answer the second time, what have you done with your life? But this time the emphasis was on to show me. But I understood what he was saying. He was asking me, had I learned to love my fellow human beings the way that he totally accepted and loved me? And when you look at it, you look at it from a place to review and to be critical of yourself, not to be judged, to be condemned. There is no condemnation in it. There is none. There is nothing but, hey, look at yourself. Look who you really are. And look what you've done. And then give it a value in the eyes of God. The death experience gives you a value of what that love is that you are so deeply loved and that you yourself so deeply love. You begin to sense a part of yourself greater and far more magnificent than you ever give yourself credit for. Frequently, too, people tell us that this being is also interested in the knowledge that they've acquired in this life. Mm. If there is a scene in which one is seeking knowledge by taking a course or attempting to understand something, that this being comments in an almost offhanded sort of way, that even after we die, the process of learning goes on, and that, that what we learn here, we can take with us to the next realm. People say that love primarily, and then in a secondary, almost grace note sort of way, uh -huh. that it seems to be the, the knowledge and the understanding we acquire. How interesting. After a time in this light, uh, all of these people have to pay a return trip back. And it's very interesting that when they do, after having been in the presence of this being of love and light for a while, they literally don't want to come back. They resist the attempts very often made to uh, send them back. I never wanted to come back. 
I wouldn't have traded, and I would not trade today. For the few moments that I got to spend on the other side, I wouldn't trade 20 of these lives. And when I had to come back, I came back dragging, kicking, and scratching, because I didn't want to. And I'm told then, are you ready to go back? No, I want to go home to the City of Light. No, don't you want to go back? And I could hear my daughter and look back and see her and my husband. They were saying, bye, don't go. Come back to us. Mama, I need you. Mom, come back. And they asked me again, are you ready to go? I said, no, but it seems that my daughter needs me, so I must go back. I really had no reason to go back except that I can remember my mother. And I know that I'd put her through a lot. I was a very ac accident-prone kid. And she used to say, if you ever die before I do, <laughs> I'll never forgive you. My mother was so adamant about me. <laughs> me not dying before she did. I think that's what first came into my mind. We are alive because of love. And this was what brought me back, which, to be honest, I didn't want to come back. But this love brought me back, love of that people who wanted me back. Other times, they say that they're given a choice, that they're told that they can either uh, go on with the experience that they're having then, or else they can um, return to the life they've been leading. She said, you can stay here, or you can um, uh, or go back. If you stay, you're going to have to go through everything that brought you to this point. And at, that, at the same time, I was seeing the things that had brought me to that point, my, the things in my life that were painful. There were other things, but somehow the things that had been painful were the things that made the biggest impact. And I knew that I didn't want to go through that again. So there is no way to escape uh, that if you try to kill yourself and you succeed, somehow you're going to have to go back and live the life from the beginning and go through everything that was painful in your life and then have to go from the point where you killed yourself also. So uh, you're not escaping. And people will say to me, they say, well, Daniel, what about hell? I'll say, well, they didn't bring it up, and I darn sure didn't. Because maybe they might have checked and said, hey, Daniel, you're on this wrong list. You're supposed to be somewhere else. They also want to know about hell. Is it a fiery, burning place? Well. Uh, what I found to be hell was separation from God. This is a total hell. Darkness, where I was first. This is the same as somebody told you, uh, the separation from light, from love, from God, from infinity. Of course, this is hell. That's why suicide was condemned by all religious. That's why they are telling that you will go to hell. It means you will go to nowhere. And nowhere does not exist. It means you will go somewhere on opposite than goodness. Very often they're told, it's not your time to die yet. You've got things left to accomplish, so you must go back. This weekend I was in morgue. And on Monday, I was taken from morgue, washed and they began autopsy. Uh, it was 11 o'clock in the morning when they opened my abdomen. They took hematoma, hematoma, and they began this T kind of autopsy. And some great power took me with neck, I think, that part I can explain, and pushed me down. And I saw this movement down and then I felt my headache, and I opened eyes. And this was coming back to my body. The next thing that I knew, I was floating over my body in the emergency room, and they were working on me. Then they stopped working on me. They put a sheet over me. They filled out a piece of paper, and they rolled me in a room. And I was lying in that room, and I was hovering above myself, watching myself. Then I heard what appeared to be an elevator door open, and these two guys came in, and they were getting ready to take me someplace. I later found out that that was probably the morgue. 
Then at that exact moment, I was inside a body again. It was on fire. It was in pain. I could not move. So I started blowing the sheet. And they jerked the sheet off, pushed me back into the emergency room, worked on me and stabilized me. And in the course of the next seven days, I was completely paralyzed. That it's so touching to me that in the closing moments of their life, that so many people come back reporting that what was most important to them at this time was love, the question of how they had loved their fellow human beings. It had a lot of effects and change in my life. It's made me a more understanding person of others. I know I don't have the right to take my life. I would, didn't want to return, and I would love to go back. Someday I will, and then I hopefully can stay and not have to come back and try again. But I know I cannot take my life and go there. Things would not work out right. But I, I think I'm a better person by watching for the needs of others and not being always selfish. Oh, I'm still selfish. I'm still a human. But it has changed my way of thinking. How to love other people and how to, how to forgive and to put yourself in the place of other people in order to understand them. Um, and that's something that you have to do in order to love people and in order to love yourself. Because if you hold grudges and you, um, it hurts you and it hurts the other people and it, it's uh, a barrier to love if you can't forgive. You don't necessarily have to forget when people hurt you, but you have to understand them and forgive them. And um, I think that that is the most important thing about love that I've learned and how to look at how we're alike rather than how we're different. This is the main message which I brought back, that love is what can be, cannot be changed. This is everlasting. And love is with life always together. Love, what keeps this world alive. Love <clears throat> as an eternity. Love as a, mm, as a basic of humankind. Uh, and uh, we are alive because of love. I think the most important point about the death experience is that it is orderly. And the fact that small children, all the way to grown people, have similar experiences. And if people could understand that if they would pay more attention to each other and to care and have faith and hope in each other, we could also begin to believe and have faith and hope in the true nature of the love of God. And not God in a, in a religious value, but God in a spiritual value. And through love, all things are truly possible. And also they tell us that their fear of death is totally gone after this, that they have no more fear of death whatsoever. I saw life as an infinite life, infinite light, as an everlasting being. We, we cannot die because we are already created for to live forever. The dimension of spirit is everlasting life. The third thing that I've learned is that life is forever. Death is nothing more or less than a doorway, it's something you walk through. Death does not exist. Don't be afraid. Death is only the part as a station, railroad station, where you come always to go to another life. I find it very comforting and encouraging to hear from so many people who have explored life beyond physical death that life goes on. So I know it's true if either of us went tomorrow, we'd be joined again in what must seem like an instant, back in a flash, as you always say. But whatever happens, I want you to know that I feel very blessed to have had you as my father, and I, I love you very much. With much love, Peter. Know that it'll be a safe journey, that you'll be taking that journey not alone, but surrounded by love, a greater love than you understand. And when you get to your part and place in that journey, whether it be not to come back or to be like a few of us to return, know that it symbolized the orderly way in which God has prepared life for each of us.
and in that life, the orderly passing and movement to another life, that you do not die, that the love of God sees you through all things, and that you will be forever just in another place. It was about three weeks later when we got the phone call. I was told that he died with a smile on his face and the last words he said were, the light. 